air. What will we do without it? <laughs> this is William Henry. I mentioned him earlier. He's the guy that came up with Henry's Law. It said gases dissolve in liquid in proportion to pressure and temperature, and Henry's Law is a big part of our life. If you want to see it every day, just go out and get yourself some Canada Dry Club Soda or anybody's club soda or anything that's got carbonation in it. Shake it up, open the cap, and you will experience Henry's Law. The gases stay dissolved in the liquid as long as the pressure is in there, and the pressure is in there because you're trapping that gas under the cap. But as soon as you release the pressure, the pressure drops, and those bubbles get blasted out of the bottle, and that is Henry's Law. So we use it all the time in heating. This is a compression tank, not with a diaphragm. It's the old school compression tank. We fill it two thirds with water, one third with air. Always put the air on the top. Too difficult to try to get it on the bottom. Ha ha. So now what happens here is if this is attached to a hot pipe in the system, the heated water in the system is gonna rise up by gravity and bring the cooler water down. Now, Henry's Law says, since you're not pumping water through here with the circulator, and we can't do that, remember, the circulator cannot add or, water, add or remove water to the compression tank. Since we're not pumping through it, the water in the tank is going to be cooler than the water in the system. So when you get this kind of a gravity circulation naturally happening here, the air that's in the cushion gets absorbed into the tank water because of Henry's Law. And that cooler water, which has air dissolved in it, is going to come down into the system, and it's going to join the flow of the hot water going out and it's going to wind up coming out of solution and and be in a radiator somewhere so every time the system cycles we lose some air out of a radiator through an air vent and that gets replaced by fresh feed water which is cold which contains air and the level in the tank goes a little bit higher on each cycle as we lose the air until finally the tank is waterlogged and somebody's got to go out there and blow the water out of it and replenish the air so if we could prevent this gravity circulation, we can prevent the loss of that air cushion. And the way that's done is to use this device that B&G came up with before I was born. It's called an air troll tank fitting. And it works by having this little cuff that you see over here and this tube that sticks up above the, uh, the water level in the tank like a periscope. So on the job, it looks like this. So we separate air down below with an air separate, rises up by buoyancy. And it goes up into the tank, and the hot water that's rising up with it can't go any higher than this because it's the top of the tube. Right? That's higher than the water level. And the hot water coming up can't get under this cuff because hot water won't sink. It'll only go up. So by setting it up this way, you effectively stop the gravity circulation between the tank and the system, and you won't lose the air that's in the tank. So there's still plenty of those compression tanks out there, and if you're dealing with one that's waterlogged, that's the solution. Also, if there's a gauge glass on the tank, be careful about that upper valve over here, because the gauge glass is supposed to be kept closed all the time, because that upper valve on the gauge glass set is not wet. It's in the air, and that will leak air. And as soon as the water rises up and wets it, it'll, the gauge glass valve will never leak. But that's a good source of losing the air. So if you've got a gauge glass on a big commercial tank, keep the valves closed all the time. Diaphragm tanks were pioneered by Amtroll out of Rhode Island, and uh, they were the first to do this. They came up with the idea of, of rather than collecting the air in a tank, they're going to expel it from the system, and they're going to work with this, with this diaphragm that has water on one side and, and system pressure on the other with, that we charge up with a, with a valve. And uh, this is, this is the, the prototype of their first tank. They, they gave me this. They made this out of uh, two street lamp blanks. And they, they put a rubber diaphragm in between, and they, they hang them from a basement ceiling. Here you see it's upside down. But that, that proved the concept that you could trap air on one side and uh, water on the other. And as they began to make these tanks in the early days, they used they didn't have a Schrader valve on there, but they used a chunk of dry ice. They put the dry ice on the, on the air charge side, and it would, of course, evaporate and put carbon dioxide in there. And they knew how much dry ice to use to create a 12-pound pressure inside the tank. The problem was, as, as time went by, is they found out that the rubber diaphragm that they use is a semi-permeable membrane, uh, like a balloon. And, you know, a balloon will lose the, the air right through it. It's, it's by uh, osmosis, so there's, there's more pressure on one side than there is on the other, so the air just moves right through the balloon. And it was doing the same thing in these tanks, and Amtrol uh, expects tanks to lose pressure at, at a rate at least one pound of pressure per year. And that's why they now give you the Schrader valve which you could use to pump the tank back up again. But it's you really can't 
pump it back up if it has water pressure inside of it. So you got to disconnect it from the system. But before you throw those tanks away, uh, check the pressure because it could just be that, that the air moved through the diaphragm and got released through an air vent out in the system. Air scoops, uh, also widely used by Amtrol and other manufacturers, scoop air. And they work by having the air bubbles at the top here. So we're looking for what engineers call laminar flow, which means that it's not turbulent. Laminar is the opposite of turbulent. If you've ever flown an airplane, you know what turbulence is. So they'll tell you that they want this thing installed in a, in a straight run pipe, at least 18 inches long, and with no, nothing in that pipe, it's got to be full size, horizontal, straight run. What you'll often find on job is this thing is uh, screwed right into a street elbow. So you've got very turbulent water and, and the air can't get scooped off. But the air's got to be at the top of the pipe to get pushed off on this, this kind of a plow into this lagoon and spit out of the system. So if it's not installed properly, it's not going to work. If it's not installed properly, it's not going to work. This guy put his air separator on the coal feed line going into the system. Now the air comes out of the system when the water gets hot, so you need a boiler to do that. So putting, it, putting an air scoop on a cold water feed line isn't really the way to go. But, uh, but this is the stuff that we see on HeatingHelp.com all the time. Come and visit. Spiroven is, is a company out of the Netherlands that was uh, founded by a family called the Roffelsons, and I've, I've visited with them over there in the Netherlands, lovely people. And they came up with something that was very different from an air scoop and, and uh, looks like this internally. They have, a, they have what is a piece of an element from a convector that they, that they also made. And they worked uh, with a principle of adhesion and collision, so, or collision and adhesion. So they could take these tiny little bubbles that, that are called micro bubbles. And you've seen micro bubbles if you've ever poured uh, tap water into a glass and it, it looks milky. That, that is not milk, that is microbubbles. And you know, if you let the water sit for a while, it just goes clear again. So those are the bubbles that the spiral vent type of an air separator will collect. And it does it by having those microbubbles just go through this nest of, of tight wire and it just clings to the surface and then floats up into this, into this lagoon and, and gets spit out of the spiral vent. And what was nice about this is it can be installed in either direction and it doesn't need any kind of special approach piping. And they put themselves on the map in the early 90s by coming to America and having these displays that you've probably seen at trade shows where they, they pipe a spire vent, which is clear, see-through plastic, into a, a plastic rig and they, they've got a circulator in there and they give you a bicycle pump and you can plun plunge a big slug of air in there and you watch the... It goes through the pump and it spits it through the spire vent. The spire vent just laughs at those bubbles and just spits them right out. So it was a pricey item compared to an air scoop, an air scoop but it became very popular because it did work and it, it, and it did get rid of the air. But any air separator will get rid of the air eventually if, if it's installed properly in a closed hydronic system. Honeywell uh, bought from a company called Sparco this air separator and they renamed it the Power Vent. And it's similar to the to the spiral vent came out you know shortly thereafter but uh, they couldn't use of course that proprietary element that was inside so they decided to use a fitting brush and and i, I love this when i first saw it because uh, you, if you can make an air separator out of a fitting brush which to me said you know if, if you can't make money in america you're just not paying attention so there you go uh, bell and gossip came out with their uh, wonderfully named enhanced air separator which also has a fitting brush inside of it so there and uh, also works pretty well and Taiko, uh, no fitting brush, but it works with a vor vortex, vortex, and it's called a vortex, but it takes the water in and spins it in a circle, causing the air to go to the middle, the heavy water to go to the outside, and it spits it out that way. Uh, Watts has a similar thing, and uh, theirs is called a coalescing media and the dual flow assembly, and I, I love the names that they use for these, and it's a uh, well done marketing, coalescing media. So, uh, uh, you say coalescing meter, I say fit, fitting brush. So it all gets rid of the air. Uh, Taiko's got a big air separator that uses these pole rings, which are very tiny. And this probably holds thousands of them. And, and again, the, the air separator is nothing more than a wide space in the road. When the water gets in there, it has to slow down. And the air bubbles will collide with and cling to all these little surfaces that you see in here. So this, this whole air separators is loaded with these things right up to the top and then the air gets into this quiet lagoon away from the flow 
and just comes right out of a high capacity air separator and it's gone from the system for good. Bell and Gossett years ago came up with what they call the roll air troll, which has an opening on uh, a tangential opening. So it's on the side of the device in and out. And when the water comes in, it's going to spin in a whirlpool like that. And they have this baffle in the center. So the water has to squeak by the edge of the baffle to go through the strainer and get out. And in doing so, it, it's, it, it has the least amount of air in it because it's going to spin like a vortex, making the air, which is lighter, go to the middle. And the heavier water that has less air in it is going to go to the outside. And that's the way they make that work. So these are all common air separators that you'll see out in the field.